Good afternoon, everyone. I have with me Robert Felix. You know him as the author of Not by Fire, But by Ice. He runs the website iceagenow.info, where you can find an enormous amount of information on our changing climate. In addition, he's also written the book Magnetical Reversals and Evolutionary Leaps, which is timely as well because the magnetic excursion on our planet. These two books alone will explain all of the changes going on on our planet at this moment in time. The intensification of the grand solar minimum, the cycles in our sun, the galactic cosmic rays, Birkeland currents, the electrification of our atmosphere, and the telluric currents on our Earth's surface, and how this is going to affect all of us. It is literally a reset button for society. And I don't know what we're going to do with our food supply. <laughs> it all comes back to that same thing it, again. It does, back to that food supply. And I don't know that we have time to, to do anything about it. Well, during Little Ice Ages, that's one of the things that happened during the, the 1600s. That's why so many witches were burned at the stake, is is in Europe, the, they would have huge hailstorms that, that wiped out the crops. And of course, as we're doing today, they wanted to blame humans, so they would blame the local, quote, witch and burn her at the stake. Uh, there's a astrophysicist, Sally Ballyunas, out of, out of uh, Harvard, that uh, that she somewhere on my website I've got a video when she's talking about it, but uh, she figures that fifty thousand w- people, fifty thousand so-called witches, were burned at the stake during the Little Ice Age because uh, because the crops were being destroyed and they had to blame it on somebody. And now, of course, we're we're trying to blame it on humans again, but. Uh, you know, if a farmer loses his entire crops for a couple of years in a row, uh, he's probably got his whole farm mortgaged, and all of a sudden he can't make his payments, and he's going to go out of business. And he's not going to have time or the money or the wherewithal to suddenly move a couple hundred miles south in order to start a new farm. So, and and so much of our our world is based on on just in time delivery which I don't blame them, that's how it has to be, but I don't know if we have time to to correct that. I'm, I'm going to suggest that uh, people better have their own garden. Uh, they, they, they might want to have their own greenhouse and certainly find a way to protect it from huge hailstorms, but uh, I think it's going to be everybody for themselves, for themselves, and, and you, better, you better have your own way of having your own food supply. From your previous studies looking into, how far south did the weather change enough to shift growing zones? Do you have any information on that in terms of, you, you know, you've delved so deeply into, you know, where the edges of these weather fronts or ice fronts or climatic fronts or just change fronts would have stopped? They've only progressed so far south because you talked about certain regions of the planet. The tropics, the semi-tropics remained relatively the same with smaller temperature decreases so where, in your opinion, do you see grow zone shifting where it might uh, – where's the edge of one that is – for an example, Canada is going to go completely offline, in my opinion, for growing wheat. And Heilongjiang in China is going to go completely offline to literally almost zero. So one of these parts on the planet that you consider a major grain producer, such as northern China – they're going to get an, another drought that comes with this and the cold, and they will just not be able to grow this wheat. So where does it leave us with the edge well, of some these of the areas zones? are this might be counterintuitive, but during the last ice age, uh, most of Alaska was not covered with ice because it's you know it's surrounded by ocean, and so uh, uh, I, I know it's a very big place. I've lived there, but but uh, most of Alaska was not covered by ice, so that should be okay. In the United States, the ice descended into the United States. Seattle was covered by about 4,000 feet of ice, four-fifths of a mile straight up. 
But the ice only went as far south as, as Olympia, as, as the state capital of, of Washington. If it had been 100 miles south of Olympia, it would have only been about five to six degrees colder than it is today. They could tell that by seeing the kind of plants that grew there at the time. So Seattle was covered. The ice uh, extended across toward uh, uh, Spokane. Spokane was not covered, but it was covered with a giant lake. Uh, Coeur d'Alene was not covered. Then the ice essentially followed the Missouri River. So if somebody is looking at a map and look at the, the Missouri River, on the north side of the Missouri River, there were cliffs of ice about 15 stories tall. But south of the, of the Missouri River, you could have survived. You know, I've, I've uh, many years ago, I lived in Juneau, Alaska, and there's the Mend Mendenhall Glacier right there. And I lived in an apartment that was just maybe a half a mile in front of the glacier. You can survive near a glacier as long as you're not under it. Uh, all of New England, every part of it was covered with ice. Uh, New York City was covered with ice. In fact, the, the ice extended out to Long Island. Long Island is essentially built uh, as the terminal moraine of that ice sheet. But one of the, Chicago was covered, but uh, one other thing that's, that uh, I've read is that essentially the climate of Chicago moved to Georgia, to Atlanta. So, and, you know, and, and in the last few years, I've been seeing Atlanta get more and more snowstorms. So yeah, I'm yeah. thinking that's it. But but uh, even if, if Atlanta does all of a sudden have the climate of Chicago, you can still survive there. Certainly people do survive in, in, uh, in Chicago right now. So I'm saying that under a lot of circumstances, eh, there's going to be a lot of places on this planet that you're still okay as long as you've got food. Well, we'll go back to the modern minimum for a moment. You know, the stories and well, let's start with the lithographs that they had of the glaciers growing and advancing in Switzerland. This is a really famous lithograph. Well, they had the priests up there throwing holy water on it to try to make it go back into the mountain. This is the same time that they were burning witches. And, you know, even over here, I did a video talking specifically in Salem and a couple areas there that had when the wheat harvests were good there were less witch trials when the wheat harvest was incredibly bad for those couple years in the late 1700s witch trials went right back up again it was crazy the correlation and you know in Europe as well the, the harvest and the witch trials had a, a definite tag to them where the the better the wheat harvest the less witch trials the worse the wheat harvest the more witch trials but growing glaciers on your website iceagenow.info you know, I come here frequently because I believe that it's going to take a combination, a culmination of everybody's wisdom into this whole change, into this colder climate. And it's going to take everybody's resources combined to put a playbook together where we're going to move forward. But even on the left side, you're talking about the categories here. We've got growing glaciers, you know, not just in the U.S., but down in New Zealand as well. And then just today, uh, Australia is receiving, you know, snow and it's two months early for the snow to start, with frost as well, right near the capital. But Mali, that same area, southern Australia, right there on the border, um, they had some difficulties over the last couple of years growing grains. So it's already showing stress fracture points in Australia to lose part of their grain production as well. And how many harvests can you go until our staples declines year upon year? And what kind of economic stress will that have? What if you're paying three times more for your food, five times no. more for your food? Then what? Antarctica, I mean, what's going which on? is, uh, you know, it's down there on the bottom of the globe, and, and most people don't realize how big it is. Antarctica is twice as big as the, as the uh, contiguous United States, and the ice is growing in Antarctica. Nobody bothers to mention that. Well, Antarctica contains 90% of the world's ice, so if the ice is growing in Antarctica, that means that 90% of the world's ice sheets are growing. But all we hear about is the ones that are, that are melting. Yeah, the, uh, 
the uh, glaciers in New Zealand had been growing, then they they pulled back for a little bit, and now I just posted last month that they're growing again. You know, we hear about the, that the Himalayas, that the ice was going to be gone by 2035, but as a matter of fact, the, the glaciers in the Himalayas are growing. Glaciers are growing on Mount Everest. They're, they're growing on K2. They're growing on, on Manga Parbat. Uh, glaciers are growing. Uh, glaciers are growing. The biggest glacier in Chile is growing. The biggest glacier in Argentina is growing. Uh, glaciers are growing in the United States, and I've got a feeling that probably most people who are, are listening to this from the United States aren't even aware of that. Well, that's a deep statement. And Robert, I thank you so much for your time. I've been wanting to talk to you for a while and putting some of my videos up on iceagenow.info, and I appreciate that to try to share the information. And it all does come down to it. You know, the easiest explanation is the way to explain it. I think we're on the same page on this, and uh, the more we can do to get the word out, I think the better it is. All right, and you've been listening to David Dubine and Robert Felix, author of Not by Fire But by Ice and Magnetic Reversals and Evolutionary Leaps. Also, the website IceAgeNow.info with the latest following the changes in our climate in the cooler weather that we're experiencing and the other knock-on effect in our society. I appreciate your time, Robert. Thank you so much. Thank you, David.